Hey, what's up guys and gals? My name is Rick9G. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm gonna have a very special guest on today. I'm so excited to have him on. It was simply my pleasure to be able to talk with him. He is someone who goes back to these original TV shows that I cover, The Munsters. We're talking about Sanford and Son. What's happening? Give me a break. Smothers Brothers. So much. Uh, that I think we're gonna have to bring him back But that's only if you support this video and support all the wonderful things. He says he has an amazing story many amazing stories But one I really love of Red Fox. So hopefully you tune in. Please help me welcome Ted Bergman Thank you so much for coming and joining us here on Rick 9g uh, My agent called me one day and he said hey this new show the Smothers Brothers is looking for young writers um which today everybody wants young writers. In those days, the writers, most of the writers, transitioned from radio into television. So they were older guys. Anyway, um, and I was still working as a probation officer at the time. I wrote a sketch uh, based upon The Dirty Dozen, the movie The Dirty Dozen. Um, I sent it in, they liked it, and they hired me. And I was the youngest writer on the show. I think it was all of 28 years old. Wow. Um, yeah. um, and I was there in the first full season of the show. Uh, absolutely had no clue of what I was doing. Had very little. Um, um, have you heard the expression as far as story is concerned and story construction? Have you ever heard the expression, get your characters up a, three, uh, up a tree? Yeah. Throw rocks at them and get them down. Uh -huh. The producer of the show say that to me, and it's such a simple thing, and it's true. Create a problem, accelerate the problem, solve the problem. Right. You know, and basically, it's what it could be a six-minute sketch or a two-hour same thing. Anyway, so uh, I made my bones there. It was it was rife with uh, politics backstabbing, whatever, and had a couple of guys who were, at that time, I thought they were really old, they were both 35, took me under their wing and kind of protected me and helped me with my stuff, and I survived that first year. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, I was a genius. <laughs> yeah, if you come off a hit show, yeah. no matter who you are, the executives, network people, and so on, they don't go by what you are. They, they don't go by who you are. They go by what you are. And wow. if you come you know, genius, oh, he worked on Smothers Brothers? Yeah, we want him. And I could be a total doofus, but they right. don't So, yeah. It's all about the reputation, the credits you have, the work you've done, things like that. Hey, about Sanford and Son, because you were, you were pretty prolific in that. Let's see, nine episodes. What do you remember about that? And what can you, can you share about that? Because there's a couple of good ones here. Well, God, where do you start? I was, I, was, I was dead broke. I was 30 years old. I hadn't had a steady job in a couple of years, a little here, a little there. Um, I came off of Smothers Brothers, then I went to the Jonathan Winters show, and I didn't, then I didn't work for three years. Oh, wow. Four years. Oh, I got a little bit of this, a bit of that, you know, and so on. So I... Um, realized I had X amount of dollars left, maybe about three months, you know, and I saw Sanford and Son. I had come on. I loved it. I absolutely loved the humor yeah. of him, all of that. So I wrote a spec script. Well, I said, I'm going to write a spec. I got to do it for this show. And I knew that it had to be normal. I knew that it had to be awesome. And I was really struggling to come up with an idea. And one day I was living in an apartment building down in Marina Del Rey. And there were two Japanese girls at the elevator. And we got to talking and they tell me that they're opening a catering business down the hall. Mm -hmm. And that gave me the idea for the story, which was, as it turned out, um, that a Japanese, at that time in the mid 70s, the Japanese were like the Arabs of today. They mm -hmm. had Japanese. And uh, so I got an idea where um, um, a Japanese real estate company has come in to watch because property is cheap there. 
and they're buying up all the houses on the Sanford block to build a brewery. Right. A brewery. And he's the holdout. Mm-hmm. And um, so I wrote the script and I had a really good agent at the time. Right. A real aggressive good agent who sent it over there and they liked it and they bought it. And then I came in to for rewrite notes and I took the script home and I re- rewrite on it. And then they called and they said, we, lo- we really like this. We want you on staff. And I was the only staff writer on the show. The wow. only one here. That's amazing. And um, it was really, um, I worked for some producers who are absolutely crazy. Um, if I met them on the street to this day at 80 years old, I might even take a swing at them. Oh my gosh. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being to see <laughs> you guys. Um, they let me have my own voice. Um, they let me run with it. Um, they were highly complimentary, which gave me a lot of confidence. Red would come in. Uh, Red and I were not big buddies, mm-hmm. but come in and we would chat about the show. Yeah. I'll tell you a real quick story that you will probably like. One day he comes to borrow some $20 bills. They're playing liar's poker. Okay, poker with the serial numbers on, on, on dollar bills. Okay. We used to play it for a buck. They played it for $20 bills. You can oh, lose. Yeah. Anyway, so you have $20 bills. So I gave him what I had in my wallet and a following. We're at the script reading. We're all sitting around the table. And he's sitting across from me. And he shoves something over to me. He says, here, mustache. And I used to have a 70s big old Tijuana cab driver mustache. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here's your. So I was doing something with the script. I wasn't paying any attention. I just stuck it in my shirt pocket. Yeah. And that night, I'm going home on the freeway um, out in the valley. And I get pulled over by CHP. Mm-hmm. And that in those days you could get out of the car my dad was an attorney he said you ever get pulled over just go over talk to the cop have your license in your hand be friendly and you, you know see what happens you yeah. don't do that no but anyway so i get out of the car what's going on he says you know you made a lane's change no big deal i just wanted to check you out make sure you're okay looks at my license we're cool take care i go walk back to the car and the sun is setting and it's blinding me and I reach into my shirt pocket. I'm not at the car yet. Yeah. And I put my sunglasses, put them on and what red gave me falls to the ground. And I look down and I see it's a hundred dollar bill and it's twisted at each end. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I go home and there's at least a gram of cocaine inside. Oh okay. my goodness. He gave me a little present. Okay. <laughs> now, pop. Half it was looking the wrong way. If the cop had seen that, wow. it was twisted like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't even know it was there. Red gave it to me, and I all you know. In those days, you go to prison for cocaine. Wow. You go to prison. Yeah, I was gonna ask you that. I was like, you, it, it was pretty severe. I told him about it the next day, and and he was just really upset. He was a great guy. He was a lot of fun. Um, um, he was. Uh, prejudice in any way. If he liked you, he liked you. If he didn't, he didn't. You know? um, yeah, there were. Yeah, I was two years on that show. I left after the second year um, to go to Europe with my girlfriend. Okay. Is in nine months in Europe. Uh huh. Yeah, don't go, don't go, don't go. Because I turned. I at that time, the end of that show. Um, I was two days away. We had bought a VW convertible, and I was two days away from from leaving for Europe. And I mean, I want you to meet this guy, Dick Ebersol, uh-huh. uh, producing a new late night show called Saturday Night Live, and he would love to have you come on staff. And I said, No, I'm going to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. That's a good story. You'll have those stories too, Rick. Oh my goodness, that's awesome. Is there is there a sort of, because there's so many, I can't even, I'm sure you maybe remember them, maybe one or so, you may be like, oh yeah, that one. So the Sanford Arms, Sanford and Sunrising, Lamont and Love. 
The engagement man always rings twice. Older woman, divorce, Sanford style, a lot of them. The masquerade party, strange bedfellows, home sweet home. I missed one or two, Sergeant Gork. Any of those were like, oh, this is the one that I really enjoyed seeing. Um, any of those stick out to you as your favorites or one that you, you really enjoy? Home Sweet Home and Sergeant Gork. Home Sweet Home was the Japanese. Okay. That was called Home Sweet Home. And, um, well, you may get this joke. Mm -hmm. My favorite joke is they're negotiating to, to, to the Japanese buy their house. Uh-huh. So the second act opens and Red is sitting in this chair and he's got the newspaper in front of him and Lamont comes in and he says, what are you doing, Pop? He says, I'm looking for the one ants. If we leave here, we got to find a place to live. He says, look at this. He says, two bedroom apartment, swimming pool, you know, two bedroom apartment, rec room, gym, this, this, that. And Lamont says, that's for singles only, Pop. Yeah. And he says, well, who do you think we are, Ozzy and Harry? <laughs> <laughs> in those days it was close enough to where the joke worked everybody knew who Ozzy and Eric exactly it was such a white couple yeah it was it was a bit um timely in that sense but it was something that everyone enjoyed I can't tell you I've, I've been made tons of San and Son videos I love the show but everyone that talks about it is like man there could never be a show like this ever playing today the other show which was significant to me remember i told you when i um had to write a piece of material for sanford not for sanford for smothers brothers and i wrote the um the sketch the sketch parody of the movie um the dirty dozen mm -hmm. and uh it never got produced on on smothers brothers but i rewrote it Red came into my office one day and he said, hey, Ted, I want to do something different. I want to do something, you know, let's do something, maybe a flashback, you know, what I did when I was younger, something like that, whatever. And I said, and I was thinking of this sketch of which I had like about 14 pages of it already, uh -huh. written almost five years before. And I said, how about something about World War II? You know, what'd you do during the war, Dad? He said, oh, great idea. So, um, Basically, it was the Dirty Dozen, where they go into Germany, and um, that would, and that was the first one of the first shows I think Pat Morita was on. Mm. Okay, here's something may, you may or may not know. I'm living in Marina del Rey. I'm on my first year on Sanford. Yeah. Maybe halfway through the season, there's a knock on my door. It's Sunday afternoon. And I'm standing there, bushy-haired guy introduces himself as Gary Shandling. Oh, wow. <laughs> 27 years old. Yeah. And he said, I heard that you write for Sanford and Son, whatever. And would you read my spec script, my all of my spec script? This is, do you know the, do you know the Yiddish word chutzpah? I've heard it, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He's nerve. You got a lot of chutzpah. A lot of guts, yeah, nerve. He was in the right place at the right time because I had struggled to get where I was. And so I read his script and it lacked a lot of structure, but there were some wonderful jokes in it. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, uh, eventually within a few months, um, he and I co-wrote a Stanford and Son together nice. called Sam Rising Sun, okay. which the character of Achu, which was Pat Morita. Yeah, Achu. But there is a macho concept in sitcom writing, mm -hmm. which is the later you stay up at night to work on the show, the better it's going to be. Wow, so, interesting. And my joke in my book was, think about that. Now think about it at 3 o'clock in the morning. Case yeah. closed. Okay? And there are two ways. So um, I always railed against that. Um, and um, I, I butted heads, and I actually made myself somewhat unpop unpopular. Um, but there's something about me um, that if something is wrong and it's obviously really wrong, it's very difficult for me to turn my head the other way. Yeah. 
And um, uh, now Mort Lachman, Mort Lachman is a legendary writer, producer, did all of uh, Bob Hope's specials and shows for many years, um, was producer of All in the Family for many years in Archie's Place, and he was on Give Me a Break. And Mort and I got along great, and Mort loves writers, he buys them presents, books that he likes. He's the best guy in that area. But, but because he worked for Hope, and those writers were on call 24 hours a day. Wow. He came at two o'clock in the morning from Hope saying, hey Mort, I'm in Cleveland, I'm doing a luncheon and I need four Cleveland jokes or something like yeah. that. You do, you do the third, you do the Wednesday, I'm talking about a five day week, start on Monday, shoot on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, Wednesday afternoon, you, you have a, uh, a late in the day. And based upon the results of that rehearsal, you have a rewrite night that night. You've heard about rewrite nights. Yes. Well, Mort's rewrite nights would last until two, three o'clock in the morning. Wow. And he, yeah. Because he, he would bullshit and bullshit. And wouldn't, we wouldn't get started until eight or nine o'clock at night. And one day I went into his office because my wife was pregnant at the time and mm. I wanted to spend. And I just said, crazy. You know, this is, you know, you're sitting there, you're bullshitting on the phone with your wife. You're going down, you're talking to agents, and we're sitting here with our thumb up our ass. We can't get started until you give us notes. You give us notes right after rehearsal. We go home at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, yeah. instead of 3 in the morning. Just makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Only I put it in, you know, in a lot more diplomatic terms than I just said. And I've dealt with that. Um, we quit full house, just walked off the show because of because they felt that um, three, four o'clock in the morning, working weekends, and so on. And you don't need to. Right. If, like any business, you know, if you put your stuff together, if you have the right people in the right area, you budget your time. And when you're working, you're working. And when you're not, then you can bullshit. Fred Silverman. I've heard Fred that Silverman. Name. Yeah. Fred Silverman. For about four or five years was head of comedy NBC. Mm. He went from ABC and he had huge hits, St. Elsewhere, blah, blah, blah. And Fred Silverman is responsible for me being a writer who never got his own show on the air. I wrote about maybe 15 pilots over the year and never got one on the air. I don't think that many, probably more than 10. Um, and he was responsible for three of them. Yeah. Uh, one of them, one of them was um, NBC, and Mort came to me and they said they've got Don Rickles under contract and they want a sitcom with Don Rickles. And here's the idea, and we want you to write it. And what it'll be is a backdoor pilot. Backdoor pilot is like Robin Williams was on Happy Days, okay. or the early where they come on and the character is so successful that they give it a spin up Norman Lear did it with Maud. Right. So we did a backdoor pilot. thought it was pretty good. Um, and um, um, Fred turned it down. But that I had a great time with Don. And he's probably, you probably heard, he's the antithesis of his character. He was. Just a really wonderful guy. I don't think I watch any other sitcom, and I know there's some good ones out there. I loved Friends when it first came out, mm -hmm. you know, because I was in love with Jennifer Aniston. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and there's some good stuff, but I think you're right in that, that I don't think the writing has gotten any better mm -hmm. in most cases. I never understood two broke girls. Yeah. I never understood. I thought Modern Family was okay, but it was a pale version of a Norman Lear show. Yeah. You know, so, so I'm not saying oldest is the best. I do think, I do agree with you that there's a lot of really bedrock, bedrock great sitcom of those days yeah. that were hugely popular. But again, you got to remember it, it was a more innocent time. Mm, that's you know? True. Mm. I dream of Jeannie and Bewitched yeah. and, you know. Um, Even Gilligan's Island, time. silly, cartoonish. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, that's it for this video, guys and gals. Thanks so much for joining me today. Like I said, if you did enjoy this, don't forget to leave a thumbs up, subscribe, hit that bell notification to let YouTube know that you do want to see more videos just like this. Like I said, I think I would love to bring Ted on here. He has so many stories, so many cool things to give us in terms of information on his perspective, his life experiences. He was simply amazing. Thank you so much to him for being on the channel. We'll see you next time, and don't forget, be hopeful. Thank you so much to my Diamond Tier Patrons, Gary N, David D, Paul T, and Ricky. If you want to be named here in the credits, make sure to look at the link in the description and you'll be able to receive more exclusive giveaways only on Patreon. We'll see you next time.